Hey, what's going on, everybody? Hopefully, uh, hopefully my mic's all right. Got kind of a weird setup here, but uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the stream a little bit differently than normal. I'm going to, because uh, I want this to be used for a little bit more public con uh, consumption than normal. So I'm gonna start out uh, just kind of playing this replay of the test fire and talking about my E3 impressions. As we get more people in here, um, I'm gonna shift to Q and A. Probably play some Turf War. Go towards uh, a little bit more of a normal. Uh, normal stream setup. So, uh, so yeah, let's get, uh, what's going on, Midnight? How you doing? Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Uh, this, I'm gonna be talking mostly about Toxic Mist and Splash, because except for three games that I played in the, uh, Test Fire, I played Splash, and I was really interested in Toxic Mist, so. Hey, look, my webcam's dying. So, um, yeah, so first off, I just want to say that uh, another reason I want to talk about talks, uh, about the Splash a lot is because nobody really in the tournament used Splash for good reason. It was pretty bad. But uh, that doesn't mean that I think Toxic Mist is bad. I just think that the Splash is bad. Or at least the Splash doesn't have any business with using Toxic Mist. It's kind of like the Custom Junior where it can't really do anything with it. It doesn't have as much range. Going from Zimmy to Splash... Uh, it, it feels pretty bad. Having um, significantly more range than a 10 attack and being able to slow people down and then going to significantly less range than a 10 attack uh, is pretty tough. That being said, I did learn a lot and the weapon was fun. Uh, but uh, for people that uh, that like Splash and were interested in the kit, I don't think it's... I mean, I don't think it's that bad. It's just bad for my play style, which kind of focuses on, you know, like Toxic Mist and, and kill people, slow them down, support. Uh, the weapon does, like, almost everything it needs except for range. It has great coverage, uh, great movement. Uh, it's flexible, doesn't really need uh, any particular abilities, but it just doesn't have the range to follow up on Mist. The, the, uh, the whole, like, inkjet after you've uh, poisoned someone combo is cute, but it, uh... Hey, what's going on, Adita? Uh, the, the the poison into inkjet combo is pretty cute, but it's not exactly, uh... It's not exactly that worth having, uh, you know, having that lack of range. Uh, either way, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about po uh, Toxic Mist. So for those who don't know about, uh, about it, po uh, Disruptors are out of the game. And the new, like, poison weapon or, or sub weapon or whatever is called toxic mist so they're pretty much the same as disruptors they just have a new name and instead of being kind of like a, a burst bomb that puts a, like a poison effect over time on whoever it hits uh the new toxic mist they still explode on impact that's something to keep in mind uh but instead of putting a poison effect on the player they have a lingering effect in the area in the form of a poison cloud so if you throw a dis a, a, a mist at someone the same way you would throw a disruptor and you hit them it, you're going to have the same effect immediately you're going to slow the person down uh, however instead of uh doubling uh instead of doubling ink consumption like the uh the disruptors did it actually drains your ink over time and I don't think that Toxic Mist halves your uh, special meter gain like like uh, Poison di or Disruptors did. That's a, kind of a lesser known, uh, I guess, attribute of getting disrupted in Splatoon 1 is that your uh, your special meter gain gets cut in half. I, I, we weren't really able to test that, and it's not that significant, but I think that's gone too. And the effect gets uh, stronger over time, so if someone stays in the mist... Uh, over time, that if the the slowing effect and the ink drain effect is going to get significantly worse. So you kind of have to move out of it. You're kind of forced to move out. So yeah, it, it, because the the toxic mist lingers a lot, I think that in the end they're going to be better than uh, disruptors were. But they're going to be harder to use and have a lot more counterplay, especially because if you escape the mist, you stop being poisoned right away. And also uh, because uh, Toxic Mist is more expensive ink-wise than Disruptors were. Disruptors were 50% of your tank. Toxic Mist is 70. Uh, we were able to confirm that by taking screenshots. And there's more white ink. The original Disruptors had just a moment of white ink. Uh, about as much... It, pretty much, I put a sub-a-sub -sub saver on my Zimmy builds, and throwing out a half charge with that uh, worth of ink that the one sub saver saved me after two bombs was enough to get rid of the white ink like more than get rid of the white ink now there's about 85 frames of white ink that's about a second well that's a second and a quarter uh to put in perspective i think 
I think splash walls, according to what uh, Silver was tested in, testing in Splatoon One, are like a hundred something frames. So it's not that much, but it's more than uh, it seems to be more than splash bombs and uh, or splat bombs and suction bombs. I have to test that. But what that means is that it's uh, they're a little bit less spammable over time. Even when you put like ink recovery and or sub saver on, you have to wait for that white ink before you're able to start uh, restoring ink again. Yeah, white ink means the, the amount of, uh, so when you throw something, or whenever you do any attack, uh, your ink tank goes down, and then there's like a white hologram of ink that what you just use. So let's say that you, this is your ink tank right here, like my head, <laughs> and you, th oh wait, no, my webcam's dead, let's wait for it to come back. Alright, cool. Like, my head is like your ink tank, and you throw a suction bomb, and your ink goes to like here to where my eyes are, above me, right here, is going to be like a white hologram of ink, and that will slowly move down to where your ink has gotten to and once that white ink disappears and moves down to where your current like amount of ink is then you can start recovering ink again uh the 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 toxic mist has 85 frames from what we've been able to tell of hey look it's kibber um 85 frames of white ink so that's a that's a, a significant change that means it's over a second of having to wait before you can recover ink what that means is that since toxic mist is the same cost as suction bombs and splat bombs you can do a double toxic mist build with uh, two pures worth of ink saver sub, which at its cheapest would be one main and one main and nine subs because that's the least amount of points that hits the threshold. In fact, I think you might be able to do one main and eight subs if I'm not mistaken. Or you definitely can do uh, two mains and five subs to save you a sub. But that's like exactly what it takes to throw two bombs which means that if you throw two bombs you're you're 100 out of ink and you can't recover for over a second so that's a pretty big deal so you're gonna be forced to run a little bit more sub saver to give you more bombs afterwards and the problem with that is after two pures the um the ability scaling of your sub saver is so high that in order to get a significant amount of bullets to make up for that uh, second and a quarter of not being able to recover ink after um throwing your sub weapons is going to be pretty uh it's pretty substantial you might have to end up running almost three pures just to be able to throw two toxic mists and then uh have enough ink to kind of defend yourself afterwards not really sure uh this does lead me to think that if a weapon has mist and ink cloud or ink storm i'm sorry that's going to be really good uh, for for double miss builds and such, or not even double miss, because out of all the specials, Ink Cloud or Ink Storm is the fastest by far to uh, fire. Um, what it does is when as soon as you click the stick for Ink Storm, it puts a grenade in your hand, and I think it's like next frame you can um, pull the trigger and throw that bomb, and then you're back to normal, the same as you would a normal bomb. So, uh, uh, hey, what's going on, Dua? Uh So a kit with mist and Ink Storm. With, without any kind of ink efficiency at all, could throw a, a Toxic Mist one way, activate and throw Ink Storm another way, and then throw another Toxic Mist in another direction. Now, with Double Bomb, that means you can throw two Toxic Mists, Ink Storm, and throw two more. So you can get four Mists up on the map at the same time, plus an Ink Cloud. That's a lot, a lot of control. And I think that uh, would be very strong depending on what gets it. Uh, unfortunately, if it comes, if it, if we get it on mini, it's going to be a little bit unfortunate because mini's going to need run speed. I would really like to see that on something like Dual Squelcher, and considering that Pro is basically better than Dual Squelcher, and it Pro gets a uh, point sensor in Ink Storm, we might see Dual Squelcher get uh, Toxic Mist in Ink Storm to kind of say like, oh well, let's give the the Squelcher the same kit as the Pro, but give it a better sub weapon. I think that actually would be pretty sick because I would totally run two mains of bomb range, or uh, and yeah, two mains of bomb range and four mains of uh, Ink Saver sub on the Dual Squelcher, so that I can run double bomb. Not really throwing double bomb that often, but whenever I pop my special, I can get four four um four poison mist clouds out on the map plus an ink storm and when you consider that some people will run like two mains of duration or whatever on their kraken or even more or like like whatever for the, for their special i think that that's an okay that's an that's an okay way to go about it because even if you're not throwing double bomb the, your bombs only cost in 50 percent ink means that you can throw them more often in more situations because you don't need to wait for your ink to come back so that's just something that i would look forward to, for, to. if they gave dual squelcher uh, toxic mist 
and Inkstorm, I would definitely run a double bomb build on that. Otherwise, I think that running some ink recovery or some sub saver and not going too nuts is probably the best way to go about it. Uh, it there's going to have to be some testing. Inkstorm looks. Uh, Inkstorm is kind of like. So they split Ink Strike into two things. They split it up into a, like a damaging like attack special, and they then split it into like the painting the zone kind of special. So Ten of Missiles has like the kind of like air strike uh, half of Ink of uh, Ink Strike. And that, uh, you know, you, you pop out, you take out the 10 missiles, you aim at someone, you fire. I mean, you've been watching these gameplay, this gameplay, so you've been seeing, seeing a lot of that. Um, and Ink, Ink Storm embodies the ink part of Ink Strike, uh, where it, it paints really well. And a lot of people have been saying that they don't think it looks that strong, that it doesn't look like it paints enough, that it doesn't um, seem to be that threatening. But honestly, I think that... The fact that Inkstorm is like the fastest special by far, it, the, all the other specials force you into some kind of slow animation, they put you at some kind of disadvantage, they do something. Inkstorm doesn't do any of that. Inkstorm is just an instant, uh, a, a, an instant giant sprinkler that can't be shot, that moves forward. And I think that once people realize that Inkstorms are never used by themselves, that they're always a fr they always leave their user a free agent, Especially when combined with stuff that I said, where it's like the only special where you can kind of use like Echo uh, to get your your ink back right away. I think that we're going to see people. Uh, I think we're going to see people making pretty good use of uh, Inkstorm. That's just my opinion. Uh, like, like I said, if, if something gets missed in Inkstorm, being able to throw out four Toxic Mists and Inkstorm and then push up at your team is pretty huge. <laughs> like that, that's really huge. So we'll just have to see how that works. Um, let's see what else. So I guess I should probably talk about because uh, again, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, I do not think that the splash of matic is a good weapon in Splatoon 2. I think that at least not for my playstyle. I think that it doesn't have the range to take advantage of toxic mist. You you poison somebody and then you just kind of sit there and look at them. So I was able to paint a lot, and I was able to get some kind of cheesy like I toxic mist someone and then use my inkjet and kill them. Inkstorm mist combos, they synergize too well. Yeah, um, I. I you know, it's. I would also not be surprised if we don't get that. But I think there's some other kits that would be good, uh, which I'll get to in a in a second. This is from the test fire, Eric. This is um. Uh, there was a test fire session where I just wanted to record it because I was streaming for like two hours. I didn't feel like uh, clipping it afterwards, so I just have this. But uh, yeah, yeah, this is test fire. <laughs> Actually, Kiver, uh, you were uh, you were in this. I, I'm pretty sure uh, at the start of the episode uh, we matched. <laughs> um, no, I didn't try out the blaster. Bread tried out the blaster a lot. The blasters seem to be much better with um, with toxic mist than splash was. The blaster was able. Uh, it has more range and it's able to hit around corners and stuff. So when it actually toxic mist people, it's able to follow up on those uh, on those disrupts uh, a lot like the vanilla blaster in Splatoon One. It's just that the vanilla blaster doesn't have an invincibility special like. CRB does and or, or or Zimmy does and it's just it's not used that often. Um, but another thing that's really nice about the blaster that a lot of people don't realize is that when you splash down, I think this has changed from the test fire actually because I'm watching this test fire footage and I don't see it happening. But uh, in the in the E3 demo, there's a uh, shockwave damage. Whenever you splash down, there's like a shockwave of damage that seems to go further than the hologram suggests when you splash down, and that seems to do about 50 damage. So what was happening was uh, people increase my bitrate. Um, I mean, I drop frames when I when I go up much higher than two thousand, but that's uh, whatever. But um, but yeah. So w what happens a lot is the blasters would uh, they would one way or the other they would either get splash damage on somebody that preferably is in toxic mist and can't run away and then splash down and even though they were outside of the range of the splashdown they would die from that shockwave damage because the blast would do 50 damage the shockwave from the from the uh splashdown would do 50 damage and they get the kill or they would do it the other way where they would splash down hit somebody uh with the shockwave damage with the the splashdown from like an area where they couldn't like shoot back as nicely and then go and get the kill um and i think that's also good for splatter shot a lot of people don't realize that uh i i wouldn't I really know if about the hitboxes of the blaster. I would ask, uh, I would ask Brett about that. They seem to be about the same, but uh, 
it's it's hard to tell what like the damage values are and stuff. But yeah, either way, the um the splatter shot's also pretty good at that too. You throw some burst bombs. You you do like swim up to somebody, you throw some burst bombs, and you just click uh click splash down, and even if they get away from it there's a good chance that they're going to die from the shockwave damage. And because they have the swim away, they don't really have time to, sh to turn around and shoot back at you, which is why I think that attacking someone and then um, going for the splashdown is the better way to go about it, instead of splashdowning and then trying to get a follow-up damage. Because if you splash down, they don't die, they can shoot you afterwards, but if you get some damage on and then splash down, they'll just die. Because they have the swim away, so they can't shoot back. Uh, so th that was really strong. But uh, I definitely would prefer... If L3 gets... Actually, I think that if L3 gets the same kit as Vanilla Blaster, I'd really prefer that because L3 has a problem where... Hey, look, it's Hermes. Uh, L3 has a problem where if you miss, you get punished a lot. And there's a lot of situations where you get partial damage and you can't quite finish the kill. Splashdown would help that a lot. So it'd actually be similar to in concept to Zimmy, where you... Uh, you paint, you disrupt, you paint, you disrupt, you support, you support, and then once you get special, you kind of go in really aggressive. I think that actually an L3 with that kit uh, of uh, Toxic Mist and Splashdown would be really strong and actually have a very Zimmy-like playstyle. Obviously, the bubble wouldn't be usable for your teammates, but to be honest with you, even the best Zimmies, they don't really try to bubble more than one person that often. Uh, because, first off, Zimmies have heavy depletion, and if they just kind of sit there and wait too long and wait for, like, the perfect situation for bubbling with teammates, uh, they, 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 they don't have, they don't paint as much, they don't have as much pressure or control, and if they die, they lose everything, so it's not really that useful, and also just because of the aggressive nature of Splat 1, I think actually that, uh, an L3 with, uh, Mist and Splashdown would be really close to the Zimmies playstyle, and I'd very enjoy it. I've been practicing L3 for a while, I like L3 a lot. And if I was able to uh, get that that Toxic Mist um, and splash down L3, I would be pretty happy. That being said, I suspect that L3 might get Mist and uh, Stingray. I was thinking that that might be too good if Disruptors were the same. But with the way Toxic Mist works, people have time to escape the cloud and run away and stuff. And I think that actually that would end up being um, kind of balanced, especially since, since the L3 without Burst Bombs is kind of weak and kind of needs a better kit. Uh, but at the same time, I think that if uh, if in Splat 1, Zimmy and L3 had their kits switched and the L3 had the bubble and the Zimmy had the whale, that L3 would be a top tier weapon. So uh, it, it depends on what their, their way of thinking is. But I really do hope that L3 gets um, gets Toxic Mist because it'll be something that's unlocked early on in the game's life cycle. Uh, no matter what's... Unless it gets... Um, unless it gets Inkjet, I'm really happy with whatever special it gets, honestly. Um, I don't think Inkjet... Inkjet would be better on L3, obviously, but I just don't think that it would get Inkjet because the Splash has Inkjet. I think that L3 would get... Uh, I suspect it to get Splashdown or... Um, or... Uh, Stingray, to be completely honest with you. Uh, but yeah, uh, I also think that, like I said earlier, Dual Squelcher would be great. If Mini gets it and those other weapons don't, I'll be a little bit sad just because Mini requires a little bit more run speed than the new Toxic Mist is really willing to to give up. So I guess I would be doing something like two mains of bomb range, two mains of run, two or three mains of run speed, and then some ink efficiency after that. But it's just, I don't know, I feel like Mini's going to be too ink hungry to really take advantage of Toxic Mist, so I hope there's a better option. Mm, excuse me. I'm burping coffee. I made some iced coffee this morning, uh, just because, I don't know, I just felt like having something cold. And this is pretty good. Mm. So, um, I guess I should probably talk about some other weapons. Now, I will say that if L3 gets burst bombs... Instead of Toxic Mist, I'll still be pretty happy. Yo, what's going on, Gordo? I will be pretty happy with um, with Toxic Mist. Or, I'm sorry, with Burst Bombs on L3 because... Let me put it this way. In Splatoon 1, if someone's wearing a main a bom uh, Bomb Sniffer to reduce the damage of Burst Bombs underneath 50, and then they have two mains and nine subs of defense, so they have nothing but defense and Bomb Sniffer, a Burst Bomb plus a three-round burst from the L3 still kills without damage, uh, which is kind of insane because burst bombs are starting out under 50 health. You have no damage, etc., etc. And in Splat 2, yes, you can do um, bomb defense up, but bomb defense up does not nerf the damage coming from the main gun. So that means that uh, even if the bomb defense is good, 
in Splat 2, the L3 really won't be that much affected. L3 is probably the most damage resistant, uh, the, the, the most damage resistant burst bomb weapon in Splat 1, aside from Slosher, so that's, that's pretty exciting. And, um, so yeah, and there, there could be other weapons that I'd like to have Toxic Mist. Uh, Slasher would be a nice one. I'm saying, oh, a lot. Sorry, guys, I'll try to stop that. Ta Slasher would be a really good one. Ooh. I would be happy with NZ. Be definitely happy with NZ. I don't know, maybe a brush or a roller. Or, nah, probably not a roller because we wouldn't get that much. Heavy would be pretty fun. I would be okay with Heavy over Zimmy getting Toxic Mist just because Zimmy wants the bomb range and the run speed. Heavy just wants the run speed, and I think Heavy's going to be very good, so we'll see. And I'll, I, I think I'll move on from, from Toxic Mist at this point. The I'm really excited to use it. It's going to be a different play style of... I guess the one last thing I want to say is that for me, it's going to be a different play style because before you could throw two, bo two bombs all the time and not really need that much ink efficiency. I think that in Splat 2, because it costs more and because Double Bomb isn't really going to be good unless we get a Mist and Storm build, that you're going to go into the cycle where you're painting, you're painting, you're painting, you get one Mist out, and you keep painting. And you find time to kind of slowly recover ink, and then you start the process again. So in Splat 1, you had this thing where you could keep two people disrupted forever, or you keep one person disrupted forever and paint. That was kind of like the, the cycle that you could get into if no one was stopping you. In Splat 2, you're going to be a little bit more limited. You're just going to paint and try to keep one Toxic Mist active at all times. And if you really want to, you can get two. When you start adding ink efficiency, you can get three up at a time. But it's going to be a, definitely a transition to making up for the fact that Toxic Mist is more expensive now via painting more. Because you're gonna get your you're gonna get your tanks worth that way. So it it'll, it'll be fun to make the transition. If I hit someone with a disruptor, or I'm sorry, with a toxic miss, right as they're about to get into a fight, it has the same exact effect or better than disruptors did. So it's gonna be really fun learning how to work with people, learning how to have these team fire situations where the other team feels like every single time they go to fight someone, they're disrupted or or poisoned, whatever. And my teammates feel like every time they're about to get into engagement, uh, toxic miss comes sailing over their head. And puts the engagement in their favor, so I'm 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 really looking forward to being able to abuse that kind of stuff. That's gonna be fun. Yeah, uh, suction bomb on slasher was pretty interesting. I think that they realized that because slasher was becoming top tier with the worst special in the game, and specials are worse in Splat 2, that they knew that they had to not give slasher burst bombs. <laughs> it is pretty much what it is. And it was pretty good in the in the, the E3 build because it was the only weapon with suction bombs. It painted well. It was really good on the new maps. The new, I'll get a little bit more into the Splatoon 2 maps in a little bit, but the, the new maps in Splatoon 2 are just different than Splat 1. Completely different. Uh, they're, they're good maps as far as shooters go. There's... A lot more cover, a lot more variety, a lot more situations where you're in, you're you're in engagements with people, and there's lots of different options of where to go on the map to kind of shoot at each other, and that's really good because that, Splatoon's one biggest weakness was maps that they, they were terrible. Also, maps tend to be wider in Splatoon two and have more options out of your base where you can get to the middle of the map very quickly. But if you need if people have pushed up onto your base and you need some options to get away, the side options take you very far away from your base and force people to forces your enemy to just give up their positioning if they want to chase one person and it makes it way easier to get out of your base which is good because there's no bubbles there's no quick respawn etc to get you out of your base now so the fact that the maps are designed for teams to naturally be able to take and take and lose map control naturally without having to rely on quick respawn stealth jump or overpowered specials is good and it shows that they know what they're doing that all being said the slasher uh the, the slasher is good on a lot of these maps now, despite not having burst bounds, because of the more variety of uh, geometry and cover, and just general like ways to to move around to fight your opponents. That means there's a lot more places where the slasher can abuse its ability to slash over things and get damage on people behind cover. 
the the slosher just completely was wrecking. If you go back and watch some of the E3 footage, every time the Japanese slosher got showed on screen, he got a kill. Like, it, even if it was a trade, he was always getting kills. So I think that's why the slosher was good, despite not having burst bombs like in Splat 1. And that's why when we talked to Deadbeat and stuff, they were saying that they thought that the slosher might have been the best weapon in the E3 build. Yeah, a direct... Uh, a slosh is 70 damage, a direct burst bomb is 60, an indirect is 35, and a shockwave is 25. So if you put two subs of damage on, the 25 and the 70 being uh, 95 damage go up to 100, and any combination of a clean slasher hit and any burst bomb will kill. That's why two subs of damage is a really good damage number on slasher. Also, that's a burst bomb number. That kind of gets me into talking about... Uh, yeah, it's 25, Astral, the, the weak one. It's uh, 60 for a direct, 35 for indirect, 25 for shockwave. Now, that also gets me into talking about uh, Burst Bomb, so I'll go and talk about Duelies a little bit now, because I only played three games not using Splash. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, not using Splash. I played Duelies, Dynamo, and Heavy. Now, I felt instantly at home with the new Duelie kit. I'm actually really happy about the new Duelie kit, because I think that Duelies take advantage of Burst Bombs the way that I want to use Burst Bombs better than Splattershot does now, because there's no damage in this game, and it, and it seems that they're not going to adjust the damage of things to make up for that. If a direct Burst Bomb did five more damage, I'd be pretty happy, because that would mean that a direct Burst Bomb and an indirect Burst Bomb would kill, which is what that two subs of damage does. And people who wear defense and stuff, you just try to use ink damage under their feet uh, for those specific people to to make up for that. There's no damage in Splat 2, so everybody is going to resist your ability to get clean two shots. And, and, and then there's bomb defense after that, and the there's like a sub defense up that's stackable that defends against your burst bomb damage, and, and, it, and it's very effective against burst bombs. And then on top of that, the sub power up is still just bomb range for burst bombs. So your sub power up does not your sub power up does not negate the effects of bomb defense up. So if you rely if you try to use my long range burst bomb strategy, first off it's going to be very hard because everybody's going to resist it and then the people that decide to resist it more are going to be uncounterable. It's just they're just going to hard counter you and it's and it's and it's a shame. Uh, I would like to see the burst bombs, things like burst bombs, rapid blaster, do more damage to make up for the fact that there's no damage now because some weapons kind of needed damage to function in Splat 1. I don't think the E leader should get it, however. Uh, just to say that. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a shame. That all being said, that all being said, when I played Dooley's, I put one main of bomb range and two mains two mains of sub saver on which meant i had a triple bomb build which i did not have in the test fire it felt great and the one main of bomb range also felt great and i think that the dualies take advantage of burst bombs for two reasons first off if you run or at least my version of burst bombs for two reasons first off if you run a support build like the ones that i like to run the dually still has movement options because it has the roll so Investing all into ink efficiency and bomb range is not going to leave you as immobile as Splattershot. The other reason is that because there's no damage in the game, if you get a direct burst bomb hit on somebody with the Splattershot, they still die in two hits. It's You're using 40% of your tank for the power of one bullet. It's bad. However, with dualies, it, takes, it still takes two shots to kill after you hit somebody directly with a burst bomb, which means that with dualies, the payoff for hitting someone with a burst bomb is 50% of their of their health, pretty much, and that it, without damage, that's good. So I think that I'm going to approach burst bomb weapons in two ways. Uh, the first way is going to be I'm saying oh, again, look at that. The first way is going to be running two mains of sub saver and one main of bomb range, and then like movement speed and stuff or whatever whatever is good for that weapon. That will allow me to take a weapon like the Dooley's that paints really well and has really good support special and lightly do my burst bomb thing, but also do like a, a well-rounded slaying thing. And I think that's going to be the better option. I'm also splashdown on Dooley's. No, no, uh, Dooley's is burst bomb and tenta missiles. Uh, not splashdown, that is Splattershot that has splashdown. And I mentioned that before that I think that it's good 
because the the, the cha- I think it's a change to the splashdown since the test fire. Because watching the test fire footage, I don't see it happening. But people get damaged by a shockwave that's slightly outside of where the splashdown says that it's going to be. And if you sneak up, if you rush someone like you would do, like in Splat One with like a crack or whatever, if you throw two burst bombs and then splash down, you'll kill them with the shockwave damage, and it's really useful. It does about it seems to do 50 health, so that's good. And oh, there you go. I was testing out the uh, the shortcut for jumping back to base on the video there. Yeah, splash down is the closest thing to a panic button. Uh, oh, what the heck was I even? <laughs> What the heck was I even saying? Oh yeah, so what I what I want to do is instead of doing my, my old bomb range build with like three mains of bomb range, a bunch of sub saver and two subs of damage, I'm going to try doing a pure of ink recovery, a pure of sub saver, and a pure of bomb range with burst bombs. And what that will do on weapons that take advantage of it, hopefully if the L3 gets burst bombs, I'm gonna try this. What that will do is instead of having stronger burst bombs, I'm gonna get a lot more over time, and I'm going to have the luxury of hitting people with more burst bombs if I throw two and they don't die. And that uh, combined with a weapon like the L3 or dualies that can paint really well and follow up on the burst bombs relatively easily compared to some of the other options, I think that not for tournament level, but for squads and scrims and just for me still enjoying burst bombs, because, you know, I have quit burst bomb. Like, I don't main burst bomb weapons anymore, but I still like to play them. I think that'll be good. And to kind of end on my, uh, my talk about dualies, the dualies are really good for a burst bomb support kit compared to splatter shot because they paint better if you don't know if you roll and hold down the trigger when you're in that little stance where you hold the two guns you paint like one and a half times your normal range and you paint way more thoroughly so the dualies are going to be really good at painting really good at getting map control uh, with my build really good at spamming hit boxes and stuff across the map to loosen people up and open up pushes and such and then they're going to have a really good support special that adds more mortar to the whole mix you know there's going to be more hit boxes coming raining down on people and you get vision so it's going to be pretty good for a support build i think that i think the bomb range won't be necessary again i think that it'll be better with a pure sub saver main of bomb range and then some movement speed but it's still going to be better for a support player. It's going to more, uh, more, more thoroughly lend itself to a support player's playstyle than a Slayer's playstyle in general. Uh, I still think that there will be some pretty good dually slaying builds, but in general, I think that the the dualies would be good for that. And also, I think that dualies getting burst bomb instead of the the Roomba that they had in the test fire is really good for dualies simply because it helps the dualies compete. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, address that in a second. It, the, it, it allows the dualies to compete more easily with weapons that have more range than it, much like how Neo Splash has a larger effective range than it should because of burst bombs. And follows up burst bombs. And to say uh, to address what you're saying, Astral, um, we don't think you actually take more damage when you touch enemy ink in Splat Two. We think it's just that the uh, the effect of being hurt is a lot stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah what Block's saying, it, it wasn't as visible. Also, you'll see uh, if you look at test fire footage and such, you'll see people taking ink damage more because we were still getting used to the pro controller and the pro controller and the test fire was a little bit glitchy. Which seems to have been fixed in the E3 build, by the way. And people were just found themselves in enemy ink, ink more often, and ink resist players were used to have an ink resist, and etc. I, I don't think that's something to panic about. Uh, yeah, yeah, and everything seems to be stackable. It seems like there's no dedicated main build, uh, main um, abilities, which also makes me think that uh, Stealth Jump isn't coming back, because if ink resist and cold blooded and all that stuff isn't going to be like a dedicated main then nothing will, you know? But uh, yeah, let's move on. So the other two weapons I played were Dynamo and Heavy. I'll talk about Dynamo really quickly. Uh, I'm not a Dynamo player. I don't really have that much things to compare. We did compare the amount of flicks with a full tank, and it seems to be the same as Dynamo. I don't know if Graf has a ponytail. Uh, We were able to compare the flicks with Dynamo, and it seems to be the same as in Splat 1. I'll talk a little bit more about cell jump in a second. The the vertical flick is crazy. The vertical flick 
tends to be a two-shot kill at longer ranges. The one-shot kill range isn't that long, but still, if you watch the tournament footage, you'll see the dynamos are getting crazy two-shot vertical flicks. The horizontal flick... Yeah, this is the VOD of the test fire that we're watching right now. The um, the dynamo horizontal flick, flick seems to paint less, which is um, actually kind of significant because paint control is a lot more important in this game. So the fact that they've nerfed, <laughs> thank you, Morgan. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. <laughs> and it's and it still shows Duclis up there. <laughs> Get wrecked. But uh, I don't know how this works. I don't want to hit X or anything on Douglas there because I don't want everything to disappear. But uh, yeah, the, the 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 horizontal flick seems to paint less. The flick itself seems a little bit different. The flick seems in in Splatoon one the Dynamo flick was a bunch of small bullets that all kind of shot out together. And after some changes to the way it worked, the middle bunch of bullets could one-shot kill, and the outside bullets only did 50 damage. But because of RNG, sometimes those one-shot kill bullets would kind of fly out to the side and not go far, or they would go hit somebody on the side, or the, the 50 damage ones would go into the middle, and you'd flick at someone and they wouldn't die. In Splatoon 2, it seems like there's a very few a big like slosher slashes that come out of the dynamo where the ones in the middle are they don't seem to deviate from where you flick them and they one shot kill and the ones on the outside have a little bit of rng but they're not the one shot kill ones so it seems like the dynamo is going to be more consistent but not paint as well but i think that that's okay because paint control is so much more important that the slightly worse painting is still going to be just about as good the uh, so it looks like they've fixed the dynamo RNG. I didn't really see any instances of someone not dying when they should have with the dynamo, and I think that's because of the way they reworked it. So there's that. Um, heavy, I don't have too too much to say about. It's pretty much exactly the same as it was in Splat One. It's a remix. It has Stingray instead of Whale. <clears throat> Excuse me. The sprinkler, however, is significantly changed. The sprinkler is better. Oh, uh, the sprinkler is better, definitely better. When you first throw the sprinkler, it spins like crazy and spits out ink like crazy. Like, the, the sprinkler is nuts when you first throw it, but it slows down over time. So if you just leave one sprinkler somewhere and don't think about it for the rest of the game, it's going to go too slow and it's going to suck. But if you just periodically throw more sprinklers over the course of your match... The sprinkler is way better because it's going to paint way more. And it was really nice on the heavy. Um... Because the heavy doesn't have damage anymore, damage is very important on heavy. Three main, three subs of uh, of damage on the heavy gives it much more range, like significantly more range. It's actually kind of crazy on fall off damage, and it also makes you almost immune to defense unless unless someone has like a crazy amount stacked. Now, there's no defense in Splat Two. So the, the loss of defense immunity isn't a big deal, but the loss of fall-off damage consistency kind of is. So the heavy kind of got nerfed that way, but it also got an indirect buff because ink control seems to be more important, and stability seems to be more important, so the heavy itself is better. So I think overall the heavy got a big buff. Oh, and one other thing. The, the way the maps are designed, chargers aren't as good. It's very hard to, to find... A place it's very hard far, hard to find somewhere on the map where chargers can kind of like comfortably sit and camp because of all the variety of cover and different places to go and you always get flanked like it's so easy to flank snipers in, in splat 2 compared to splat 1 and because of that the heavy also gets kind of indirect buff because the heavy is more able to be a shooter when it needs to be than the uh, chargers do which makes the, the Heavy just adapt to these new maps a little bit better. Uh, which is one of the reasons that Deadbeat did so well with Heavy in the E3 tournament. They did that on purpose. Uh, the Snipers seem to have slightly less range, but it's hard to tell. It's just that the Chargers have a hard time... Have Chargers have to be way more aggressive and be way more perfect. You pretty much have to be a god to actually have the Sniper be top tier, it seems like. And the Heavy doesn't do that. So, yeah, there's that. 
Yeah, the, 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 we, we might see a better balance of splat charges and e-leaders. It depends. We haven't seen the e-leader yet, depending on the kit. They might give the e-leaders some kits that are bad at dealing with close range stuff, in which case we'd barely see any e-leaders, but who knows, you know, um, who knows how the meta is going to go. But yeah, that's that's about that to clear up. So those are the four weapons I played. Like I said, I didn't think Splash was good. I think Toxic Miss is great, and I'm looking forward to better weapons that, or weapons that take better advantage of it for the way that I want to play. The Dynamo seems more consistent and overall the same. The Heavy seems over, all, overall the same, but because of the, the the changes in the game, it got a lot of indirect buffs. And the Dualies feel great for my Burst Bomb playstyle, which I don't think will be very viable, but I'm looking forward to using it. And I think it'll be a good flexible Slayer slash support weapon that I want to use in more of a support way. So let's talk about the maps now. I already mentioned that the maps in general are wider and the distance from the map to the spawn, or I'm sorry, from the spawn to the middle of the map is shorter. The wide maps mean that if people are trying to spawn camp you and you go far to the left or right, uh, I'll get to that in a second uh, about the graphics. Uh, so because the maps are wider, if you are getting pushed up on too far and you go far to the side, the people trying to camp you don't have access to you. So it's a lot easier to get back map control. This is great considering there's no QR or invincibility specials that were kind of needed to get out of those kind of situations in Splat 1. It, it, the, the, the maps have really good map design. They, the, there's a lot of geometry, a lot of varying cover, a lot of ways to get back control when you're on the back foot. It's, they're just good. Now, uh, a little bit of the exception to this rule is Humpback Pump Track. Humpback Pump Track is huge. I think Humpback Pump Track might be bigger than all the other maps that we've seen so far. Kind of like, like a big open kelp dome. Now, that being said, there's still ways out of your base. And it's actually kind of hard to, to spawn camp people on Pump Track because the, there's so much surface area and people can go everywhere. But it's it's a long distance to the center of the map on Pump Track. Pump Track feels like a Halo map. It feels actually like a Halo Forge map where everybody would try to remake midship. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. But the, pretty much what we saw... Fuck you, I'll make it work. <laughs> uh, Humpback Pump Track has a circular raised top mid structure. It has an outside ring around the map of raised cover. It's just it's a the pump track goes around the outside of the map and it and it, and it kind of flexes and the hills and bumps and walls attached to it make it so people can kind of safely get around the outside of the map. But you can go all the way around the outside of the map to where the enemies are. So you have this conflict of when to control top mid and wanting to control the sides and stuff. So I think that it's going to feel very Halo-esque. I think that long-range weapons are actually going to be pretty decent on it. But at the same time, it's probably easier to to um, easier to hump people. It's easier to flank people on humpback than the other maps. So it's going to be interesting how that works. Slasher is really good because Slasher can be in the middle area uh, between top mid and the sides and slash up and hit, hit people. You saw a lot of that during the E3 tournament. And it's, yeah, it's a big arena it's very large, it has a lot of cover for moving up, and it's definitely going to be, it's similar, to, it's like a big midship from Halo where, easier to hunt people, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's like a big midsh midship from Halo where there's a top mid structure that you want to control, and side areas where you need those to control them, so I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, it's hard to really say much more about it, it's kind of simple, The there's not that many ways from the middle structure up top, but on the sides but there's a lot of ways from the sides down bottom obviously so it's uh it, it's going to be one of those multi like those maps where it requires multifaceted control where there's several there's a few points on the map that you have to dominate and it, what's probably going to happen is one team will get left one team will get right and they'll fight over mid without sending too many people there so we'll see how that works uh, oh to, to talk about the graphics yes the graphics are better just straight up better than the test fire. This is test fire footage. Uh, there is more fluid animations. The game seems to run way smoother. The controls felt better, although the TVs that we were given were kind of crappy. The Also, it seems that the stick controls were kind of fixed. I was watching uh, a lot of casuals use the stick controls, and there seemed to be no Y sensitivity over sensitivity, which is really good. Yeah, the ink looks great. Just the game overall looks way better. The animations are way smoother. The graphics are better, obviously, because they, it went from 720 to 1080. 
So they confirmed the game is going to be 1080 60 from now on. So it just looks great. And one thing I like about all the new animations, everything that they added, all the different ways that the characters will animate themselves and do cool little things whenever you take actions, unlike something like Brawl, where all the extra animations caused lag in your controls and made you have to wait till the animations finished, like you would do a you would you would perform some kind of action and then you would get stuck in that action. None of that happens in Splatoon 2. All of the little nuanced stuff that they added is just completely it's just it's only visual. It's completely cancelable. Like if you if you're doing something with the roller and your character is kind of like running or skipping in a certain way or whatever, the it's not gonna slow down the game. So and you'll notice that when you're using, especially like the rollers, the rollers are like really animated now. So I think that that is a really good sign because it means that they understand their gameplay and they understand that they want to make the game look better and feel better without actually playing worse. And that that that, that uh, voice break right there. And they were able to do that, so that's really good. Um, we think that they fixed the motion control delay. Like I said, the, the TVs that we were playing on kind of sucked. Uh, the main stage ones weren't as bad, but they made you sit really close to the screen because they, the, the, the pro controllers were attached to a wire that like couldn't move from these giant like 40 inch screens that are right in front of your face. And, and that made the controls sometimes a little bit awkward to use motion because the wire was really thick and it was bolted to the thing right in front of you. So it was kind of hard to tell, but I was able to use higher sensitivities and not feel as bad as I did in the test fire. But like I said, in the test fire I had several hours of play. I had, I don't know, probably about like an hour between one and two hours total with the game. Like, I played a handful of games each day. If you take away time in the lobby and stuff, it's probably a little bit under an hour of, like, just raw gameplay. And, I don't know. Uh, it, it did feel better. Uh, it didn't feel as jittery. Uh, what, the, the one thing that I wasn't getting was the, the feeling of... I would try to aim... And I would stop aiming, and the aim would keep going where I was going, so I'd have this like fighting back and forth where I'd wobble my aim back and forth to try to fight the lag. That was not happening, and I have a really good TV at my house. The what the problem with the TVs were that they had a lot of like motion blur on them, and a lot of ghosting. So like whenever you aimed a lot, it would kind of blur your vision and make it hard to see. And that was just the TVs. Like it was obviously the TVs because it was doing it with everything. Like in it, when we played Mario, it was doing that too, and being like right up with it right up in your face didn't help either. But that being said, I did not get the camera sloppiness feeling that I did in the test fire, and people who were using sticks did not seem to have any kind of signs of the Y sensitivity being uh, busted, which is really good. Juicy stuff that the public doesn't know. I, uh, I mean, I'm kind of saying that stuff. Uh, there, I don't know any like super big secrets though. I mean, we weren't really we were special guests, as in like we were Expo Pro, but that's not like. Expo pro passes just mean that like when the when the people working there see you come up to the the counter, they know that you're not just like some random kid walking off the street and to try to make sure that you get the best experience and sometimes we got to like cut in line or whatever. But it wasn't like Nintendo didn't take us into a back room and give us all the dirty secrets. If if they did that to anyone, it would have been deadbeat, but all the stuff that they said, they didn't sign any kind of NDA about that stuff. They did. They were able to ask questions to Nintendo about specific mechanics, which is why we know what exactly sub save, uh, the sub power up does for certain weapons. But yeah, I, I don't know that. Um, all right, let's keep uh, let's keep going on the maps. Art Academy, the Inkblot Art Academy was really nice. It also followed the general rule of thumb of being wide, having easy to go left and right at a spawn to avoid enemies and having a short distance to the center of the map. It changed a lot between modes. There were extra structures that only appeared in certain modes. It kind of feels like museum and black belly mixed. It's like a small museum with a top with a top mid structure and uh, low docks underneath. And I think this recording is gonna end. No, this still goes for a while. Uh, but at the same time, it's really small, like Black Belly, with the top mid structure. So that one's really cool. Again, let's see if this is going to... Oh, it's going to work. All right, fine. Again, the the amount of cover and the amount of options to move around and the amount of little bits of cover that influence individual firefights was a lot more than most maps. That's why the slasher was good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the, uh, the Inkbot Art Academy, I felt often... 
that the map was really segmented. Like traditional shooters, where if you're in a certain area, it, it wasn't. None of these maps are room based; they're all open. But the separation between different parts of the stage made it feel as though my friend and I controlling an area was actually controlling a discrete area. We couldn't shoot at the people across the map; they had to come to us. There were certain points of the map where you had to meet to kind of exit your room and get to another room there were like specific contention points and it felt really good and really consistent and really straightforward and it definitely felt like a traditional shooter map i mean all the new maps did and art academy uh one thing about art academy that was really weird in turf war is that the surface area at the base was ridiculous the bases are so big at art academy also kind of like museum but just way more to the point where like i would spend the first minute of every turf war match that we played on there with the splash just painting the base it, it was ridiculously large not that it really matters that much in rank modes besides the fact that it's kind of like pit in that you have a reserve of inkable area near your base to the point where you can rely on certain specials being able to be built when certain players spawn and you can kind of save that area and not turf it on purpose in those rank modes so that you can get those specials later uh, let's see what else. And then, oh, of course, uh, Main Stage. I think Main Stage is just an amazing map. Main Stage, all of the things I said about having multiple ways out of your base, about being able to get back into the action, about having variable cover and segmented areas, uh, about having like discrete locations in the map that felt like structures instead of just like a bunch of uh, like one big area, like Splatoon One maps are with just kind of like some cover thrown in and like some lanes main stage is it man main stage feels like a halo map there's a top mid structure that has a tower on both sides that's complicated has lots of ways to get up on top of it a lot of little nooks and crannies that like you can get up to um uh, i didn't play salmon run but i'll talk about that in a second it's uh the, the yeah the top mid structure with two towers to the sides Grates going around, pathways going underneath, ways to get up on top. It kind of almost feels like the lockout tower at some points from Halo 2, if you've ever played that, where you can just get up and around and have all the sneaky movement around and, 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 and just keep moving, keep getting to new high locations to fight people from other s directions. It, it was great. And then on top of that, there's two towers. So approaching that mid-structure, your side of the map has two towers and another raised platform and then some cover and then more raised platforms but be be behind that like the, the, just main stage was just such a well-designed map and it, it feels like like these maps don't feel like the splat one maps where it's they're just kind of linear there's a, you, there's a choke point in front of your base there's a choke point at the middle of the map there's the middle of the map and then it does the same thing to the enemy it's just there's so many options to go so many movement paths to take it just it, they're just so good and, and main stage was probably probably exemplifies that all the most it just it was a great map i don't want to say it's my favorite because i liked all the maps but main stage definitely was like okay this feels I, I, it's just i want to say like this feels like such a like an, a real good shooter map but the other stages did too so i don't know what are you gonna what are you gonna do what are you gonna say uh just main stage was awesome and it felt like a like a halo map or just like a traditional like team deathmatch shooter kind of map it's it's awesome. Ten missile. Can you ten missile someone who's jetpacking? Uh, I think yeah. I think it'll miss really easy. But uh, you're probably gonna miss. Uh, I did not get to play salmon run. I'm gonna talk about salmon run in a little bit. Yeah yeah yeah. Uh, that was uh, that was Austin that did that lock. Uh, he was actually talking about how he was using suction bombs to kind of corral Dynamon and punish him with missiles in the slasher. It, they didn't really show that many perspectives, but he got a lot of those. And I'm gonna have a little bit of water because my voice is like at this point. So give me a second. And I've been recording, I think. Oh no, that's right. I, I was, I was, I had like the pre-game show on for a little bit, so that's almost done there. Um, when this is over, I'm gonna decide if I'm going to play some turf war. No, this is not another test fire. This is just footage of me playing the first test fire. CND. I don't know who CND is, unless you, unless you explain to me who that means. But uh, <clears throat> but um, but yeah. Let's let's move on from maps. Uh, I like I said. I don't know if I'm gonna play some turf war and splat one after this, or I can play some footage of that scrim from last night that I was showing at the start. But whatever. Um. So the so let's talk kind of quickly about. The game mechanics and balance. I already talked about aim. I don't think I have to talk about that anymore. The the general. Uh, let's talk about the map first, actually. So the new map is awesome. It's 
so the difference between using this map yeah I don't think I, I've never heard of Captain Nintendo dude before I've never heard that name before uh, so the difference between using this thing for your map and using this thing for your map is that with this thing you press the Y button to bring up your map it covers your whole screen and you can use the motion to move your reticle around and click A on some of the jump or you can use the D-pad as a hotkey to your teammates or down to the base and then hit A to jump and that it's it's a huge improvement like I can't I can't emphasize how huge that improvement is because what it means is that instead of having to take your eyes off the screen look at your lap hey look it's fuzzy look at your lap orient your your eyes find what you want to look find somewhere to orient your eyes find what you want to look at find it look back up at the screen reorient yourself it's just there's so much brain power and time wasted and not being able to look at your screen that that really stops people from being able to check the map unless they have nothing else to do in splat 2 it's totally different if you're clawing you don't even need to claw or x whatever i'm used to i'm used to halo controls whatever um it's the, it's the X button. It's the one at the top, okay? It's the one at the top. It's X on Nintendo controllers. It's Y on Xbox. I'm used to Xbox. Uh, yeah. So, um... It's super easy to just tap it twice real quick at any point in time to just bring up the map really fast. And because the map always shows up in the same location based on your screen... So, like, if you want to look at their right side of the map, all you got to do is look a little bit above and to the right of your reticle, tap the button twice, and just see if there's enemy ink there. It's super easy. And th th that's actually what I should have talked about when I was talking about Heavy. With Heavy, it is so, so easy. When you're using Heavy to paint the map, it's ridiculously easy to just start, sh open the map, because you can use all your buttons and stuff while you're... The only thing you can't do is jump, because... Oh, no, you can jump, because bees jump. Yeah, uh... So yeah, there, there's no, there's nothing that uh, there, there's nothing that you can't do with the map is open, and you can kind of see and the the map is kind of see through a little bit, so you can see what's going on. But with the heavy, it was so so easy to just start charging. The actually, I, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, do I having having the the X button up at the top as map is going to be a big big deal because if you want to play optimally, it having it right next to your pointer finger like, even if you don't claw like I do and have my pointer fingers just on the face buttons it doesn't matter which one it is but if you even if you don't claw having your pointer finger up by the the right bumper the X button is so close that you can like claw that without that being the way that you play like these pro controllers are really nice on your hands you, you're gonna be able to just real quick tap double tap that uh, Y button trust me it's it's you, you're gonna be happy it's at the top but Either way, yeah, you charge your splatling, you open the map, what you close the map and release your charge. It was so easy. Like, I think one of the reasons I'm really excited that I've been practicing heavy in anticipation for Splat 2 is because of that change with the map, where I'm going to be able to get ahead of the curve by practicing open my map all the time. And then I'll be able to transition that to other weapons. I think heavy is going to be the easiest weapon to learn that with. Maybe dynamo, maybe dynamo, I think, but... It just heavy it's so easy to just open the map constantly and you it's so easy to see you can see enemy movement in ink you can see all this other stuff i think that the meta in splat 2 is going to change a lot just because of the map mechanics and being able to um you don't need to use the pro controller you can just uh oh it's in the other room but you can you can take the joy cons and do it too uh there's actually a holder for the the switch itself so you take the switch itself and you place it into like a big like grip holder that makes it kind of like a big controller but if you take if you just put the joy cons in and you just get them stable either by it being that way hopefully by itself or by you just putting something in between it's going to be like holding the, the the joy con now so a lot of people are going to like that so and that's going to be like 20 bucks so and there's also a battery charger version of it that might be a little bit more expensive, but more useful. So if you don't, if you can't afford the Pro Controller, or you don't like the Pro Controller, just use that. It's going to feel more like the gamepad. It's probably going to give you a little bit of advantage. The sticks are going to be worse, but the aim's probably going to be better. So it's up to you. But uh, I think the Pro Controller is worth 70 bucks. The Pro Controller is great. Um, yeah, it is, a, it is a massive hassle to look down all the time. Yeah, the Joy-Con... Uh, yeah, this new... Uh, it, it, got put, it, it got released. There's a Japanese version of it out on like Amazon. I'm assuming that the U.S. version is coming out soon. But the uh, the charge grip is it's it's a big charger. It's like a big rechargeable battery pack that it's supposed to be like a 
like a mobile battery pack that you use to plug into the switch and charge it while you're on the go. But if you take the Joy-Cons and slide it into the side, it's just like holding a switch. So there's your, your gamepad size thing, and that's going to be good. Yeah, some people hold... Your, so Nintendo wants you to hold your gamepad like a steering wheel in front of your screen, but n not many people do that. I know Savage does that, etc. But, uh, but yeah, just being able to use the map is going to be such a big deal. Such a big deal. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the, the balance, though. Because the game's definitely going to change as everybody gets good at looking at the map. And you painting actually gives away your position way more reliably than it does in Splat 1. Some Tenetech trying to like cut through enemy ink and flank is going to actually um, be a lot easier to see coming. And teamwork is going to be way more important. But either way, the general way, the general theme of balance in this game is that they nerf stuff and then give it more options. Nothing was straight out nerfed. Like, even though QR was like... So the way that they nerfed QR is if you get a kill and die, you don't get QR. You only get QR if you spawn, don't get a kill, and die. And when you do respawn that way, you respawn really fast. Like, it looks like it's like twice as useful... Or, actually, I don't know the numbers, but it, it's it's definitely way stronger than Splat 1. And that's kind of like, oh, well, they nerfed it, but they gave you more options, because now if you like paint a lot, you can respawn fast, or this, that, and the other. And, but it, it's nerfed. Like, let's be real. It's nerfed. It's it's not going to be anywhere near as useful as it was in Splat 1. But things like Disruptor, they nerfed it by making it more expensive, and then gave it more options by having the lingering effect. They, they, they made it more expensive made so people aren't disrupted permanently and then they, 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 they gave it more options by having a lingering effect and stuff like that. They nerfed specials. They nerfed the, the, the slang specials by making it so you only get like one kill. For example, in Splatoon 1, the specials were more or less close range was crack and mid range was bubble and long range was Inkzuka. Now, close range is splashdown, mid range is inkjet, and long range is uh, Stingray. And hey, look, it's Bob. I just, just, just someone I know in all these lobbies. It's so funny. Uh, and the, in Splat 1, those weapons, those specials could like kill the whole team. And a lot of times they were supposed to. In Splat 2, those specials are meant to get like one kill. But they have all kinds of other applications. The Splashdown can do the, the jump in the jump in and do the, the super like rainmaker explosion thing it paints more the inkjet allows for like movement where you can you can fly around the map and move and flank and stuff and then recall back to where you came from and the stingray lets you shoot through walls and gives you partial vision and stuff so like that that kind of stuff the like i said the dynamo paints a little bit where it's been like it's the vertical flick and it's more consistent the it's just every everything in the game they nerfed it and then gave it more options and that's the general theme that you see uh, for everything and it, it it's pretty cool it's pretty cool that that's the way that they handle balance it's really it's really good because ma just making stuff weaker aside from QR which I think everybody except for like there there's a few specific spe yeah specific top players that were complaining about no oh there's no more QR the game's gonna be dead slow now which is not true the map like the maps are so much different and the 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 flow back and forth between map control and getting ready for the push and then having the push and having it all be like fast paced and having your your kills and deaths matter way more like whatever i'm not going to get into that but yeah the the general theme was that they didn't make stuff bad they nerfed it a little bit and then gave it some more options so things are about except for qr and like damage defense are just gone Well, yeah, well, Dolly is this an Aerospray, because Aerospray is still coming back. I have no idea what they're going to do with Aerospray. We'll see. Um, I, I talked about this earlier, Duat. I'll say it again real quick. The Dynamo, instead of having a lot of little speckles of ink that kind of spread out all over the place, the Dynamo now seems to have, like, a couple, maybe, like, three to five big slosher sloshes that come out, where the one or ones in the middle kill, and they don't really deviate from the middle. They always go straight forward, and the ones on the outside are the only ones that RNG, the ones that do 50 damage. So... It's definitely more consistent. But, um... Oh, yeah, no, the, the way the Dynamo is now, it's super RNG. Because they, they made the, the very center... They, they, they reduced the amount of one-shot kill flicks, or ink blots, on the Dynamo. But they spread all over the place. So sometimes you hit someone directly in the middle, and they 
die, sometimes they don't die, it's just, it's horrible. Um, but yeah, I, I, I alright, so this video is over, I'm going to go ahead and play a scrim that I was playing last night. So let me real quick bring that up. There's this here. Okay. There we go. Yeah, having a big... It's not a huge buff, but it's definitely a buff, and it definitely is good for the game, because... Like Old 96, having games won or lost by RNG from the top-tier guns that have a lot of RNG is just really stupid. Um, I think the music was the same as the test fire, but it was kind of hard to hear. Uh, oh, one thing before uh, I move on is that with Poison Mist, you can still hear disrupted people, and you can still see disrupted people. So that is good because you can tell people can't just swim, try to sneak and swim through your your Poison Mist. Also, one one buff to the way that Poison Mist the uh, one one buff to the way toxic mist interacts with teammates is that if i throw a toxic mist and i call out that i hit somebody my teammates don't need to know where the person was ahead of time they can just look at the mist cloud and throw a bomb at it so that's going to be a big benefit for me calling out for my teammates and team team firing and stuff like that one other thing i want to say about the toxic mist that i didn't really go into as much about when i said that it has counterplay right so in splatoon 1 if you if you tox if you poison somebody they just have the effect on them they, they move slow. If you get the Disruptor at all, you get the full effect and that's it. In Splatoon 2, that's different. You don't Because if you escape the, the Poison Mist, you lose the effect. First off, there's counterplay built into the game that allows you to lose the, the effect. But what that also means is that every time you throw a Poison at somebody, the exact way that you throw it is a mix-up. If you predict that somebody's going to go right, and they go left, and you threw the Mist to the right to try to predict that, them moving to the left is going to get them out of your Toxic Mist quicker than if you've predicted their movement. So I'm excited about that because I'm good at predicting movement. That's one of the reasons that I use the bombs in the first place is because I'm good at those kinds of predictions. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled because it's going to play to my play style. And also another thing about Toxic Mist is that because you can only throw one at a time instead of two, people who are really, really good at throwing precision bombs are going to, to be good at them. I felt like going from Splattershot and th having being able to throw th four burst bombs at a time to t uh, Zimmy, where I can only throw two bombs at a time, gave me a uh, an advantage. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer you in a second, Narf. It gave me an advantage because I had gotten so much practice in throwing bombs that I was able to consistently land the fewer bombs that I did throw, which is why I got so good with Disruptors, and I think the same thing is going to happen in Splat 2 with Toxic Mist. I have so much experience with throwing bombs at, with bomb range and stuff, which is what Sub Power Up does to Mists, by the way, if I didn't make that very clear, that I, I have the experience to be able to make my one Toxic Mist at a time count. And the fact that you also have to land them so precisely to guess which direction the person's going to go in, I can do that too. If I'm going to be throwing, if I decide to take a risk and go for a read instead of just blocking off where the person wants to go with the mist cloud, then I will be able to do that, you know? So I feel like I'm going to have an unfair advantage over everyone else because of my experience and like expertise in bomb throwing, uh, which makes me pretty excited because I can be better than everybody else at the start and then I can put in the hard work to maintain that advantage and not just not just abuse it without putting in a ton of work with practicing and learning the exact mechanics and stuff. And if that didn't answer your question, Narf, yes, uh, the the Toxic Mist has a lingering cloud of poison instead of just a raw effect. I think I died to a bomb here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching the, the scrim. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they were throwing Toxic Mist to the tower. I think that um, I I'm going to just have a really good advantage there. All right, let's, uh, let's move on from gameplay. I want to talk about tournaments. So, obviously, they have the Nintendo Versus thing. Nintendo showed us support. We had a lot of viewers. The stream had, like, 30,000 viewers, up to, like, 50, maybe, maybe 40. The VODs have hundreds of thousands of views, which is great, on, like, Nintendo's official YouTube. So, all right, so Splatoon has a credibility for eSports right off the bat. 
for the as far as the community is concerned, we are in a good spot because for Splatoon one we hadn't formed. We didn't form until Splatoon had been out for a while. We couldn't like play with each other at first anyway with the way the game worked and stuff. So. Uh, the competitive community got a very slow start in Splat 1. In Splat 2, we already know exactly what we want. We already know exactly how to do all our stuff. We have LAN set up. We have online tournament set up. We, we're, we're looking for like the media coverage and success. We know how to, to put on a show and, and grow a scene and attract an audience and satisfy and entertain people. So like I feel like our scene is going to benefit a lot from just that. And I think tournaments are going to happen more often, they're going to get more views, it's going to get more success, hopefully we can get those sponsors coming in, like that's that's the plan, just sponsors coming in, because once we get people being able to throw, be, once sponsors can fly people out to tournaments, once sponsors can inject prize money into online tournaments and stuff, it's, mm, that's so good, that's so good, that's so good, it, it, it definitely, um, it definitely puts us in a position to grow the scene, but also something to think about is that there's a lot like of course the entire game has been designed with esports in mind like the mechanics take more skill they've like i said they nerfed the brain dead and not skillful stuff and gave it more options so it's still good but it's it takes more skill there's wired controllers now the last update made it so if you plug in a pro controller this also updates the controller to be able to use on pc by the way that if when you plug in a pro controller it is fully wired so there's no wired interference you can do lan in both handheld mode and TV mode with the Switch, so there's no interference, there's no wireless with the LAN itself, and there's also spectator mode. So that's awesome for LANs and events. We're also talking about having some extra switches brought to tournaments to, to uh, host and spectate um, matches that aren't happening on stream. Take the camera and put it into like way up in the sky flyby mode and use like Aver Media to record stuff. And then if we do like Patreons and stuff, we can have part one of the Patreon benefits be that you have access to all the off-stream VODs from that top-down camera view, so that's pretty cool. That's that's uh that's pretty awesome. Um because of the land capabilities, there's gonna be more local scenes. There's already people reaching out to Ink TV and EGTV about helping run local scenes, and we're trying to work together, Ink TV and EGTV, to make sure that we get good coverage around the country, which is great. You know, we don't want to leave any regions not having anything, and all the regions where we have good showings and stuff that show that, like, they, they will come out to tournaments. If, if people show up to local events and show that they'll drive out to tournaments on the regular, that means that they might, that they're willing to spend a little bit more money to go to a bigger regional tournament or, like, a US wide tournament in the future, which is, makes it easier to, to, to get sponsors involved. So, like, all that stuff is really good. Um,. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit uh, tired from all this uh, from all this talking. And one last thing I want to mention is that one bit of feedback that Nintendo did receive at E3 was that we didn't like Turf War being used in the tournament. Uh, I know that that's a little bit of a controversial subject. I can talk about that research I did where I went through as many scrim servers, as many big looking for scrim channels as I could, and see and looked at how much, how many Turf War scrim requests there were, and when they were. And less than about half of one percent of scrim turf war requests in our competitive community, are, or, scrim requests in our community are for turf war. Of those requests, eighty percent were in the two weeks leading up to SSS and uh, the US Inkling Open, which were the two Nintendo sponsored tournaments that told us to run turf war. Zero. Zero of them were in the two weeks after those tournaments. What this indicates to me is that we do not want to play Turf War. When we were forced to do it, we practiced it. But if there was a... A lot of people say, oh, well, like people would just play Turf War if we got them to play it. If if people wanted to play Turf War, if there was like an uh, like this unspoken desire of the majority, despite everybody saying that they hate Turf War, everybody leaving lobbies and thinking that you're rude if you are like scrimming or have a p private battle going and you start Turf War, like that th for some reason, like that's actually not normal. You would think that there would be a desire for people to keep playing Turf War afterwards and make those scrim requests. But the fact that randomizer battles are more popular than Turf War, the fact that you get people pissed off at you if you if you play a Turf War game in a, lot, in a private battle, and the fact that nobody 
wanted to play turf for it after these events were done indicates to me that people don't want to play it. And a very real and serious issue with a lot of competitive communities is what happens when they are forced to play in tournaments and play the game in a way that is not that, that, that they don't want. Like, this is like telling Smash players to play with items. This is like uh, the Smogon versus VGC thing where the competitive community didn't want to play 2v2s and it, caused, and it caused this huge rift that still exists today. It's like in Halo when uh, people were forced to run... Uh, in Halo when people were forced to run SMG starts and radar and the competitive community didn't. Like, these rifts that occur when the competitive community is forced to play in a way that they don't like are very serious. They cause a huge rift between casual and competitive players, especially like in a sequel when new players join. It, it just, just, the way that we do it is great. We play all of the rank, everything that happens in ranked modes happens in tournaments. You play all the ranked modes, you cycle through them. You play all the maps, you cycle through them. There's no map bans. There's no map picking. You play everything. There's no banning weapons. There's no, you, you can pick whatever it is that you own. It, it, it's, it's, it, it, relates to the way the game plays normally everybody knows how to play those modes aside from like the one or two maps that like aren't in matchmaking anymore that people don't even realize that aren't in matchmaking anymore uh are is exactly the same as the normal splatoon experience and there's no way to do squads of turf war so if we do competitive turf war if we make it a thing that means that anyone who wants to get into a scene has to play a game mode that they can't practice and i think that's dumb um the way nintendo reacted to the feedback um Nintendo of Europe was a little bit more vocal about it. They said that they don't like Turf War either, but that they do it to appeal to casuals. And it's not their preference, and that if the community does not want to play with those settings, much like the way they do at Smash, they will just adhere to what the community does. Nintendo of America didn't say anything back. Um, and at E3, there was someone who's like paid to walk around with a notebook and get feedback, and the competitive players had like a big con uh, conversation with him about that kind of stuff. And again, I know this can be a little bit controversial because there, there is a small small minority that wants the competitive community to like loosen up the turf war, and that they feel that the competitive community going to Nintendo and communicating to Nintendo how the competitive community as a whole feels kind of prevents them from being able to make the changes that they want. But honestly, they're such a small minority that they don't represent the Western scene at all. The same way that Rainmaker doesn't represent the Japanese scene at all. Whatever, I don't want to make that comparison, but yeah, so yeah, Nintendo doesn't like, like like Turf either, and I think that Turf War still has a uh, an important role in our scene. I think that, that Turf War should definitely be used periodically. So let's say that like once a month or once every two months or once every three months we have a big turf war only tournament that's marketed towards lower level players that don't play tournaments to try to like get them to experience a tournament and if they like it then they can kind of like you know take it to the next level and start playing the rank modes instead of the unranked mode yeah yeah exactly that's why the great british splash off didn't have uh, turf war last year because the nintendo of europe is more receptive to the community or they i, I don't know they have more freedom to I, it's hard to really make um that kind of that kind of uh, that kind of statement. Now, I was going to kind of talk about my E three experience as far as you know, like arriving and like what happened day one and what happened day two, what happened day three and stuff. But I'm getting a little bit tired, and looking at what I have, it's a lot on these notes, and I think that that is more appropriate. For a normal coffee with Hitzel, Hitzel yeah, nor normal coffee with Hitzel episode, and I think that I am going to go ahead and not do that. So what I'm gonna do now is I just want you guys, I just want kind of like a regular Q and A thing. So I'm gonna just answer some questions, and once I feel like uh, the, the 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 stream's kind of coming down, kind of winding down to a close, I'll go ahead and just end it and upload this to YouTube, and I'm gonna like share it. On uh, on like Reddit and Squidboards and Twitter, or whatever. Like like again, I wanted this to be a little bit more of an interactive stream where I talk more about my E3 experience with Splatoon 2 and specifically for people to learn more about the game. 
as opposed to uh, my normal thing where I just kind of play and talk with the chat and it's kind of like casual and I kind of I'd like to do answer questions but again I want to make this more of like a public thing so yeah let's start answering some of these questions so what is the Nintendo should release for Splat 2 oh like a new mode well I would like I would like some kind of moving objective not like tower control but something where the the objective spawns somewhere teams control it in some way and then after a period of time it disappears and reappears somewhere else on the map forcing two things it forces the teams to move their setup all at once instead of slowly over time like tower control it forces uh, map movement and because it would disappear and reappear at a different time it would give the losing team on the back foot time to kind of relax and take back the map over the period of like I don't know like 20 30 seconds as opposed to being forced to kind of run in there like splat zones that being said tower control sort sort of uh, kind of answers that for me but I, I do think that splat zones as a mode could use a more like variable uh, how do I say it like a less static version of splat zones but not necessarily painting the zone like if there were like kind of like some kind of like big rainmaker shields with a shitload of health that it takes a long time to pop I don't know something like that especially like a, yeah, yeah 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 pretty much oddball would be really cool I think yeah I was talking to you with that DJ where it would be really awesome if there was kind of like this uh pretty much imagine sort of like a rainmaker like object that you pick up and walk around with it maybe not be the rainmaker like a weapon the same way but make it so as you hold it you get points kind of like as you hold the the splat zone you get points and have it so the further into the game you get the closer to the enemy base you have to be to get points so it gets harder to hold it and if you don't know what oddball is in halo it's uh the oddball is a skull when you pick up the skull you get points kind of like how king of the hill if you stand in the hill you get points or in the cases between splash zones as you hold the zone you get points and you can go wherever you want with it so you, f you find places on the map to have like a setup where the guy with the ball hides somewhere and etc so i think uh, a version of that in splatoon where as you get more and more uh, as you get closer to victory you have to be more risky with where you hold it i think that would be a pretty cool game type so yeah i i think that would actually be really awesome Oh, one life game to game mode. I wouldn't want it, but if it was in the game, I'd definitely play it. Like I wouldn't say like this isn't competitive or anything, but but yeah, uh, it's it's a little bit uh, sketchy. I would like to see a lack of being able to just build your special by painting. I would like to have power ups on the map where if you pick up the power up, you get your special, and not have meter involved because that would force map movement. Because a one life mode normally. Let, let, that would be super fucking campy. Like, there would definitely need to be something there. Um, Alright, let's see. Someone wants to get in the comp scene Splat 2. What's the best advice? Just try to rank and find same people with same skill. Compared to see you gain sponsor views. Good. This game looks a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so the, the competitive community in Splatoon 2 is definitely on Discord. There's a lot of public Discords that have links to um, competitive Discords. What I will do... So this isn't the best... This is not very high level of competition, this server but it is a place where the competitive community kind of hangs out. So I'm going to give you two servers here. I'm going to give you the uh, Squid Coliseum, which is kind of like a, like live competitions at all times, but it's just not very high level. It's just like solo queue. You know, it's not for teams. You just go and play by yourself. The level of competition isn't that high. Um, people, like, like you're not going to find a lot of organization, but you will find competitive players there, and it is something to, to start out with. I'm also going to give you the Academy, which is a, it's supposed to be kind of a front door to the competitive community. This server, uh, I'm a mod there, or I'm an admin there. Oh yeah, sorry for also not talking about Salmon Run, but I didn't play it at all, so I'm not the one to talk about. Uh, all I know is that Custom Jet was in there, that it was harder than what was expected, uh, that also Splattershot Jr. was in there, and that, uh, there was one point where the, the, uh, one of the host switches like froze and when they reset it it reset into developer mode that had more options than normal uh, but that's for a different time um you don't have to use voice chat in squid coliseum but 
it's definitely encouraged and if you use voice chat there's like a role that they're going to be giving and i think it's going to change like matchmaking with teammates where if you say you're using voice chat i'll try to find the other people using voice chat uh but to answer your question uh what was your name uh crap oh weto um to answer your question about what to do honestly just play with as many people as possible it doesn't matter the skill level it doesn't matter who they are always be polite always put up a good impression always show willingness to learn always show a good attitude and show that you're willing to put in work because as someone who was a team captain for a long time there's a million players that think that they're hot shit with the tenatech who are okay they're not bad but they're cocky they get mad when they lose they don't seem like they really are there to help you and learn. They see like they're in it for themselves. Or they seem immature and they're like awkward in, in ways that like... Um, I don't quite know how to put it. Like they're awkward in ways that make it hard for me to think that they would get along with my teammates and stuff. It's just be... Have a good... Per like, you know, be well behaved. Be a good character. Show willingness to learn. Just put a good impression on everybody. And eventually... <laughs> stop. And eventually, um, you'll find people that you work with. So that that's my answer, is to just leave a good impression on everybody, have a good attitude, play as much as you can. You'll find groups of people. Don't marry a group of people right away. If you get into a group of people and they don't seem like they're willing to learn and they don't have good attitudes and stuff, play with them. Of course, play with them as much as possible, but keep keep looking. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to find communities because the communities are all on Discord. So if you if you hop in those two communities that we have there, uh, that's a good way to actually find the committed community. The committed, like I said, they're all in Discords and stuff. There are, as you start to play, you can say like, hey, I'm playing a lot of this weapon. Is there a server for that weapon? And it's like, yeah, here's a server where everybody plays that weapon and they share and stuff. So there's that. Also go on Twitch and watch all the top players being... Uh, talking to people in Twitch chat and stuff is good too. I just want to throw out there that this game with L3 I did... Uh, pretty well. I was going to upload this game individually because I thought that this game um, made a good um, was a good showing of L3 as a weapon. I just want to throw that out there because this is like the only like game from the scrims last night that like significantly I thought were was worth uh, talking about. Um, yeah, let's see if there's some other um, thoughts on the Dynamo Roller. I talked about it earlier. The Dynamo Roller is more consistent now. Instead of a bunch of tiny little droplets that come out that kind of s scatter in all directions and the damaging ones may or may not go kill what you wanted to kill, it seems like there's a couple big slasher slashes that come out of the Dynamo. And the one in the middle, that one or ones in the middle that kill seem to very consistently go straight forward and the other ones seem to very consistently... Um, uh, very cons or not very consistently paint. It paints less than the old Dynamo does, I think. But the vertical flick is a nice buff. And also, one thing I didn't mention before is that I think the Stingray is actually pretty good for Dynamo. Because with Dynamo, you can kind of paint, 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 stay back, paint, paint, paint. And then whenever um, your team moves up somewhere where you can't quite paint for them anymore, you just Stingray at whatever they're going to fight. And I think that the, that, that is definitely going to be a play style for Dynamo. It's also why Stingray is good on Heavy. I think that the new system for tower control is amazing. Uh, I'll get to you for it in a second, Chiro. Uh, I think the new system for tower control is amazing. I think that it means that if you're dominating a game, you have an advantage. So the way Splatoon pretty much works is the single best push, the, the most well-executed push, tends to win the game, which is what sounds weird, but it's not a problem because the time limit's so small, and also because the, you know the state of the game does affect uh, itself in the future. But the change to tower control makes it so that success that the state of the game at one point influences the state of the game more at other points because if you are dominating the game and you get the tower past several checkpoints and you wipe once the enemy is going to have to wait at the tower so comebacks are going to have to be earned and they're not going to be free which i think is a is a big deal uh the it, it's just good i thought i've always thought the tower control is the best mode in splatoon it requires the most control and the, mo and the most pr consistent coordination over time the tower control did have the problem with the quick response stealth jump and stuff like that, but with that out of the game and with this new addition, I think that the tower control is just going to straight up be the best mode, like, by far. I think tower control is just... I really like it. 
Start a local scene. Leave a smash in town. Do something similar. Group. Super to locate people. Um. So again, Discord is a good place. Reddit's a good place, and uh, Squidboards is a good place to go. Squidboards is uh, it's owned by Smashboards, but it's a Splatoon site. It's not the most popular anymore, but it's the one like forum for Splat. So there's that. Uh, I would definitely try to get in contact with those kind of people, and just try to get a get a gauge online to see who you can find. And if you and if you and like three other people just start doing some two v twos at your Smash group. And just try to add to that over time. I think that's good too. But I think making every effort that you can to get local scenes going is going to be really important in Splat 2. Because I think local scenes are going to drive the community a lot more than they did in Splat 2. Thanks to land mode and potentially bigger audiences. If you're at a school, it's also really nice. Because you can use your school's way of reaching out to people. Uh, you know, go to... If your school's got a gaming club, go to them. I think that you said you're community for smash i don't know if you have anything at your school if you're going to college or if you're in high school but if you can go to your school's gaming club or just go to whatever the leadership is at your school either from students or faculty and see if there's ways that you can get up posters and stuff and, and, and advertise a gaming night and also like highlight splatoon see if you can get some local players that way yeah iric doing this excuse me i didn't i haven't eaten in a while and i'm just uh burping up some coffee <laughs> but uh but yeah no the the I, what Irik's doing for Boston is going to be great. I'm going to try to do some stuff for New Jersey. I know that uh, I know that Ink TV wants to do some stuff for New Jersey, but for a major and not for uh, locals. But also something that EGTV and Ink TV, like I said before, they're both uh, they're making a coordinated effort to support local scenes and try to get those local scenes distributed everywhere. So even if you can't get it going at your gaming club you might be able to find places near you. And if you do want to try to get something going, uh, reach out to EGTV and Ink TV on uh, Twitter. Let me just link to those real quick. Because if you can find these people, let's go here, Ink TV. So here is Ink TV. And let's get EGTV. So reach out to these two groups because they're the big, the two biggest um, tournament organizers for Splatoon in the competitive community. And like I said, they're, they're making a coordinate effort together to try to make sure that local scenes are as successful as possible. So reach out to both of them and see what you can do. Uh, I, I think that that's also a really good way to try to get a, a local stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, on the Facebook. Uh, I know that a lot of the Smash community does Facebook groups. So there's that too. So yeah, definitely getting involved, getting in contact with tournament organizers and talking about your plans and stuff will help you do a better job at getting um, uh, of getting that local scene started. Not in school, not U.S. German players. Oh, German players. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding it. Can you guys find me uh, Rising Moon? Creme Fresh. And I guess... All of doesn't have any German. Oh, EXT. Can someone please... Please sign me. Uh, please find me the Twitters for those uh, three teams and link them. Those are the um, the biggest competitive players that have anything to do with uh, Germany. Now, Rising Moon is, Fran is French, but he's right next door. <laughs> and I've been to Germany. I know how easy it is to just drive to another country. So uh, if you guys can find those Twitters, because I, I don't want to spend too much time finding them, but if you can find those and post them for uh, the person ask acting asking in chat. Uh, we I know that EGTV has some, some European... 
presence with just their staff members. I don't think TV does, but they're but we're all in contact with each other. So uh, obviously, if you get in contact with EGTV and Ink TV, you'll be able to get in contact with these guys. But I know that those are uh, three of the prominent Splatoon high-level teams that have influence in the countries you're talking about. Yeah, so so there's that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, cream, I, now Cream Fresh is uh, well, I know that Lean's German, so uh, maybe it's mixed. I really don't know. Really don't know. Let's see if there's any other questions up here. Helping, yeah. Um, like I said, getting in contact with EGTV and TV, we've been making some efforts to to get local scenes up and running. So there's that. GG's from last night. Oh yeah, GG's from last night. Kyo. Um, see, let's see. Is there anything I didn't answer? Let's see if there's anything else. All right, there we go. How did I get in the competitive Splatoon, Splatoon Twitch? I um, I had to buy a Wii U to get the game, and I didn't know if the game was going to be good. So for the first month the game was out, all I did was go on Twitch and watch the best players I could find and hang out and chat. Uh, and I also looked around Reddit and Squidboards and stuff, and I found like a team speak where competitive players wanted to go. That team speak ended up being used by the best team in the game for a little bit, and I got involved with their group. And I also just got involved because I was on Twitch and I was in every chat, and like just shared like my not my my history, just like showed that I had like a history of competitive games and stuff like that. Um, it seems to hog players, yeah. Um, uh, I would just uh, hang out in those Twitch chats, man, and just got to know all the good players and stuff. And once I got the game, I was able to kind of link up with some of the players that I've been talking to and that I kind of made like acquaintances with. And once I started streaming, all the top streamers hosted me. My first stream had like 100 viewers or something like that, like right off the bat because a bunch of the the, the streamers hosted me. So just I got, I, I got into the competitive community through just hanging out on Twitch and just making friends with people and having good, trying to have good conversations and stuff. I just I was already been a competitive gamer in the past, so it was easier for me to do that. So yeah, I got into the competitive community through Twitch and looking for resources on Squidboards and Reddit. Yeah, a lot of people get to know each other through Twitch. Free agent server? Yeah, let me get the free agent server for you real quick here. Is it? Am I not in there anymore? I don't think I am. Uh, I mean, Ludi. Uh, so, uh, Ludi has a looking for free agent chat. This isn't the same server, but uh, I'll just post this. This leads to Ludi, uh, which is um. A league server and they just have a looking for there's a lot of teams in there so uh i saw is, is are the, are there good teams in this game yes there are very good teams in this game um the a lot of players have come from games that aren't shooters because a lot of shooter players didn't have we used to get involved with this game but the level of play is really high japan's level of play is really high because it's much more popular there so there's more competition so they kind of you know the, the cream at the top of the japanese scene is a little bit higher but no um in the west and in america and or in europe and america and japan and even australia too there are uh, lots of really good teams very impressive high level like it's serious stuff and just as a testament to how the west has good players as well and good teams as well uh in the splatoon 2 e3 tournament america won and japanese was, japan was expected to win because they brought like really top tier talent and they have a bigger scene because the game is there's a free agent server thank you um so yeah yeah it was uh uh it, it was it, it definitely shows that it's high level uh the game is great uh the what what, what i can say about the game is that uh, well, how about this? I am my next project is to make a video designed to appeal to people who play other shooters competitively, 
and let them know that Splatoon is a good competitive game. And I'm just kind of winding down, and that's going to be a very long talk because I expect I, I, I intend to make this whole video. I've been thinking about it a lot. So um, down below, my YouTube is Hitzel89. And I'll just post it in chat just in case. Oh, no, my YouTube is Hitzel. Hey, there, there you go. <laughs> um, my, uh, my YouTube channel is, let's see, youtube.com. It is below if you're on, I think it's on mobile and on whatever that you can see my YouTube. But uh, yeah, here's the link. And just keep an eye on this because that video is going to be going up. And that's really going to explain why I think the game is very high level. Uh, as far as like movement and shooting and map control and aiming and yeah. So um, there's that. Let's see what else. Why wasn't the Japan team in the tournament one of the best Japanese team? Yeah, no, yeah, no. The, the, uh, so the the Japanese team, it was a little bit different. Um, the team that the tournament that they won, they had to stick with that roster except for one player, which they got like one of the best players in the world to to play with. So in, in theory, there could be a slightly better team comp, but it was like it was the best slasher in the world, the best cherry in the world. Like, all right. One of the best slashers in the world, one of the best cherries in the world, the best dynamo in the world, and one of the best chargers. So I, I, I know that two of those, either the slasher and the dynamo is the best one in the world, and either the cherry or the slasher was the best in the world. And then the, the sniper was like number three or something. So it was definitely like, it was definitely an, like an all-star team. Like it wasn't just a bunch of random scrubs plus dynamo, diamond. Yeah, this is a this is a vod of me playing uh, in a scrim from last night. Uh, Dynamon was the slasher, was the Dynamo, and I forget everyone else's names, but I just was told that, like, hey, th this is like this is this is no joke. This team is real. Yeah, Dynamon. Yeah, Dynamon was the the Dynamo, and like he's. Just he's the face of the Dynamo in just Splatoon period, so him being there was a big deal. And the slasher was really good. I think it was the, it was the best slasher and like just a good cherry and a good charger that were like top whatever for their weapons. Um, so let's see what else. Um, yeah, I do upload these to YouTube. Um, I'm gonna put it up right away. Well, uh, DJ, I plan to make that video under five minutes. It's uh, it's gonna be a short video. Regardless, there is no gonna, there is not gonna be a long version. I plan for it to be under five minutes. I plan for it to uh, be, get to the point. I just want to say all the right things that I know people that play competitive shooters want to hear. I don't want to get into too much detail. And then I want to sign off. I'm just gonna like be really straightforward. Like, hey, you know, like my name's Hitzel. I used to be MLG staff. I'm, I do this stuff in Splatoon. I'm a competitive player, or whatever. And this video is designed to, like, this video is to let you, competitive players of other shooters, know that Splatoon is a really good game. The second one is coming out soon. We have playtime on it. It's good. And then just talk about the 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 movement, the shooting, and the map control. Talk about uh, talk about the scene. Talk about Splatoon 2 being good and being designed for competitive play and having like land capabilities and wired controllers and wired land and spectator mode, and all the while just you know just kind of putting a good impression out there about the game. Putting uh, well yeah, it, it's gonna be Splat 2 only. Um, but but yeah, uh, and I'm gonna also link to some other places to find more content. I'm gonna link to big discords uh, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna link that stuff and it's gonna it's gonna be a very sh short short and sweet video it's just gonna focus on showing like really impressive gameplay that talks about what i'm talking about and i am going to just you know explain the the fundamentals of splatoon you know the motion controls are good the movement is awesome the map control mechanics are great and yeah just talk a little bit about the scene you just say hey like we have tournaments often there's high level play you know, and, and show Nintendo support of Splatoon 2 and how the the game's mechanics are intact, how the balance is good, how the, the game's being designed with esports in mind, but it's still easy to get into and hard to master kind of stuff. Like, yeah, it's it, it's not going to be... Uh, I'm not going to talk about Kairos. It's not, it's, uh, not going to be a... Uh, 
a dense video. I'm just going to very quickly show that the game is good, say all the right things, and tell them where they can go if they're interested in seeing more. And uh, I have some contacts back in the MLG scene of other shooters that are like totally down for like promoting it and tweeting it and stuff. I know that our community can get behind it, so that's going to happen in probably about two or three weeks. Right around the launch of Splatoon. Uh, hopefully, I, I, if I can get it to happen sooner, I will. I my my I would like for it to happen in two weeks, but we'll we'll see. But either way, um, uh, that is kind of like again, it's gonna go up on my YouTube, so check that out. I'll probably upload it to Twitch as well, just so that it's going everywhere. And yeah, so let's see. Um, but yeah, that's stuff I'll talk about later. I am getting kind of tired. Uh, let me think if there's anything else that I really want to say. Got to go. Thanks for your questions. Yeah, you're welcome, man. You're welcome, man. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to go ahead and um, call it. I'm going to put this on YouTube, like I said. Uh, these links that I said that we talked about, I'm going to go ahead and put in the put in whatever it is I put on YouTube. So. Yeah, uh, that's that's about it. So thanks for watching, everybody. I hope that uh, everybody watching live was satisfied. Uh, just a real quick answer to that. Uh, at E3, they had uh, Astro Mix Amps that just had local voice chat. Yeah. But yeah, I hope that everybody uh, who's here is satisfied. I hope that everybody who watches this on YouTube or whatever learns something. If, if you're still watching at this point, because again, the stuff that was intended for YouTube was at the beginning of the video. And this stuff at the end was more of a kind of more of a normal stream thing. But yeah, I'm tired as hell. This was like a two hour stream. Thanks for watching everybody. And I will see you all next time. <laughs>